Hello, and um, welcome to the 2024 Department of Health listening sessions regarding behavioral health licensing. Thank you very much for participating. Please be advised for recording this meeting. My name is Shauna Fox. I'm the director for the Office of Health Professions here at the Department of Health, and I'll be facilitating today's listening session. Slide two. Oh, we don't have our slides up. Uh-oh. Will, are you going to share the slides for us, please? Yes, one second. Okay, thank you. We'll just take a pause and get our, get our slides up. I'm sorry, the first one's always a little bit bumpy. While we're waiting for the slides, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, some of the other Department of Health staff who are here with us today. Um, and then after that, we will talk about how to use Zoom. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my deputy, Harold. Go ahead, Harold. Hello, folks. My name is Harold Wright, Jr. I'm the deputy director of the Office of Health Professions, and we are all excited to be here with you today. Thank you, Harold. Eve? Hello, my name is Eve Austin, and I'm the executive director of Behavioral Health Professions, and I will pass it off to Joe. I'm not Hello, sure. Everybody. I can't come off a uh, video right now, but my name is Joe Miller and I'm the executive director of behavioral health in the Office of Health Professions, dealing with the master's level uh, professions. Thank you, Joe. Brandon, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Williams. I am the project manager with the Department of Health and the Office of Health Professions, tasked with implementing 1724 and now 2247. Thank you. Next, Thank we'll you, Brandon. Oh, um, go ahead, Shauna, back to you. Sorry. Thank you. Christy? Good afternoon, everyone. Christy Spice. I'm the Policy Director for the Health Systems Quality Assurance Division. Thank you all. Um, I do want to note there are several more DOH staff on the webinar, including program managers for all of the impacted professions and representatives from customer service. But in the interest of time, we will not have everyone introduce themselves. If you'd like to contact any program manager, their contact information is on the second to last slide of this slide deck, which I shared with registrants on Monday. Will, if we could have slide three, please. Thank you. Before we begin, we wanted to provide some basic instruction for how to interact with Zoom. You should see a control panel along the bottom of your screen. If your mouse has gone inactive, you may have to minimize it to try, and try shaking your mouse if you don't see the control panel. On the far left of your control panel is a button to mute and unmute yourself. The button is currently inactive, but we will enable your microphone if you raise your hand to speak. Toward the center of the control panel, you will see buttons to open the list of participants, the question and answer box, and the chat box. To the right on your control panel are options for closed captions, interpretation, and re reactions. When we call on folks to raise their hand, you will find the hand raise button in the reactions menu. Slide four. We are also providing ASL and Spanish interpretation for this meeting. ASL interpreters should be pinned to your screen. If you cannot see the ASL interpreters, please put that into the chat and one of our team members will enable that. If you'd like to switch your audio to Spanish interpretation, click on the globe shaped icon at the bottom right of your screen that says interpretation. Underneath it, select Spanish to hear the translated audio. I would also like to remind everyone, if you're a fast talker like me, please try to speak slowly to make things easier on our interpreters. Also, video is, uh, is disabled for attendees by default. If you need access to share your video, please put that in the chat and we will enable this feature for you. I'm, I'm gonna ask Zach um, to share his screen. We're going to have a presentation um, coming up next on some of the improvements that we're making in the Office of Health Professions and the, the Office of Customer Service on our credentialing process before we move into the next part of our presentation. Zach and Harold, if you want to take it from here, I will hand it off to you. Thank you. Hello, folks. Can, can you confirm that my screen's showing okay? Can everybody see everything all right? Great, great. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Shana, and for the opportunity to come in and kind of talk overarchingly around uh, what we have been up to in terms of our credentialing uh, improvement process. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I want to say to you folks, again, is that we're not going to go into in depth uh, uh, specifics around it all, but want to come and make sure that we shared um, what we were doing um, and, and so we could take an overview. So again, uh, we have the opportunity to be reorging. Our first uh, reorg process started in March. Our last teams will be transitioning in May. And what we were finding um, overarchingly before we started uh, uh, reorging was we were finding that we had a, a host of different um, issues that were going on in terms of our credentialing in psychology specifically. And so what we did is use uh, the project pathway as a sample to go in and figure out what is it that we need to do um, to improve uh, credentialing timers? What do we need to do to reduce uh, pending uh, applications? And then lessons learned from this was then taken and used uh, uh, to align ourselves to what our reorg process is looking like. So today, um, I wanted again to share with you what that process looked like and what we found in the process of the pilot um, in order to make these changes. So some of the challenges we were having with psychology, it was, it was complex. The timelines were long. Um, we, needed, we had a board. Um, that was engaged simultaneously very early in the process. Um, we had a lot of things that were not working together. And what we wanted to do is align them and work together. Um, and so we used Project Pathway to be able to do that process uh, in our psychology pilot. Again, I need to slow down too, because I'm a fast talker. And so I want to make sure that um, our, uh, our interpreters have that right. I'm just really excited and passionate about the work we've been doing thus far. And again, overarchingly, that was what's going on. I'm going to pass it over to Zach right now, and he's going to talk about it, about what we've done in Project Pathway and what we've been doing in terms of the data improvement around this work. Zach. Thank you, Harold. Um, good uh, afternoon, everybody. I guess we're 15 minutes into afternoon. Uh, my name is Zach Patnode, and I am the Quality Assurance and Continuous Quality Improvement Administrator with the leadership team. Uh, with the Office of Health Professions, uh, and also was privileged enough to be the program manager for psychology at the time of this pilot project last year, um, and, and be very involved with the work that's been done here. I want to talk just a little bit about the status of non-routine applications with the board. Harold mentioned previously in that challenges slide that the board has its independent authority and involvement with certain applications throughout the credentialing process uh, at a level that may be different than other professions. And so one of the areas where delays were most apparent was around applications that needed to go for board review. And so through a number of changes around adding uh, pro tem members, around recategorizing certain types of non-routine uh, applications, and streamlining the tools that the boards were using for review. Uh, over the course of last year in the pilot project, we reduced the total number with, uh, with the board from 54 down to about 12. Uh, and it's maintained in that area since, which is a, a spot that we're very, very proud of. Uh, but maybe even more importantly on the non-routine process status count chart uh, on the right side of your screen, uh, seeing that red line which is applications who are waiting in line for board review, uh, reduced from 31 down to zero and has also maintained in that area. So again, in that specific area, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, no longer are folks waiting in line uh, with no action being taken. Non-routines who are categorized that way can be sent to the board and be with a board reviewer, uh, sometimes on the, the exact same day uh, and, and begin that part of the process. This is only one area, uh, only some of the applications are non-routine. Uh, many of the others fall into routine categories or endorsement or substantial equivalency categories. And through a series of process improvements in that area uh, and around our data management, our ability to track on those changes, uh, we drastically reduced our uh, days between application date and first issuance measure 
being able to issue on average those applications uh, in, in 90 days. And of course that's an average. So you have many who are faster and some who are, are longer. Uh, but at the same time as we were doing that, we were able to go back and clean up aged applications that had found uh, through one way or another, you know, their, their way into long delays. So it's a, a twofold successful project. And so with that, we're looking at trying to take uh, some of those same efforts and same lessons and apply them elsewhere as the reorganization effort happens and as teams join the Office of Health Professions uh, from our partners in the Office of Customer Service. We have very extensive scorecarding efforts going on right now, uh, being able to understand the data, the status of where things are uh, week to week and track our progress the same way that we were for the psychology pilot. Um, and so the, a lot of these pieces are very data-driven, showing where we are, showing how we're being responsive to changes. Um, are they having the intended result uh, when we make those changes? Uh, and early on, uh, we've really seen uh, some, some great and promising progress, even though it's very early in the process still. I'm going to kick back to Harold here to talk about the cultural and interpersonal pieces of this, because uh, data and tools is all wonderful uh, and are very, very helpful. And it's definitely uh, an area after my own heart uh, and my area, but those things don't work well uh, if you're not also working with the people and your leaders on how those pieces are used. So, Harold? Yes, thank you. Uh, and Zach hit it right on the head. I mean, there's the data piece of this and there's the people side, and they both have to be in alignment um, in order for it to have long sustainable uh, change that we're looking for. And some of the stuff that we have done um, in the work we've done, um, you'll see is first of how do we see our work? You know, from when we receive our application until we issue license. You know, did our current procedure meet that need? Are the times too long? We have to grapple with that and understand what is it that we need to do to ensure that we can improve those things. And then how do we change? We use data driven management. We make the invisible visible, and then we talk about it. And the way we talk about it has to be in a way that is in alignment, it's, that's positive. That's about how do we ensure that we're doing our part to help the access to care initiatives, to get people out and licensed in the appropriate manner to be able to serve uh, the citizens of the state of Washington. And then how do we maximize our partnerships? How do we work with the boards, the commissions, the legislation, the people? to ensure that these things are happening. And then we evaluate the issues and implement improves, improvements. And these are the things that people have been saying for a while, you know, we've been talking about this. Well, how come we have, well, we have, to, we have to reconcile that, what works? And then put those things and then reevaluate and reflect and then move forward. And those are the things that we have been doing. And those are the things that we're continuing to do and get the feedback and then make those uh, continuous uh, adjustments. Next, please. So with all of that, where are we today? So we have some early accomplishments. Like we said, our first behavioral health team transitioned March 1st. So for our first team, here are the things that we've accomplished thus far. Now I'll let folks read that. Be able to have, uh, sec, next slide, please. And so now our next steps, we still got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And so, but the work we have is exciting because of the information and the lessons learned. We know that data-driven management has to be the core. So we have to move our initial scorecards from all credentials to weekly canings from monthly. So we're gonna be looking at it now weekly to see if in fact, what targets we set out to do, we're accomplishing. And the way you can use that information to get resources that are needed to continue to reduce the pending application process. Policy alignment. We still got a lot of work in this area. We gotta make sure we're aligned because it all has to fit. Technology evaluation, right sizing. And when we say about right sizing, do we have the right amount of staffing to accomplish the goals set forth? And then constituent engagement. 
that, that, and again, this is a taxonomy. It's not saying that we have to have them all one's priority or the, uh, of another. We have to have them all in order for this to continue to move forward. 13, please. Now I'm gonna transition this back over to my colleague, Zach Patno, to talk a little bit more. And I'm gonna give you a little bit, a hint here. Shauna may have to come on and help a little bit more around this work. We want to make sure that we get you the right information. Zach, please. Thanks, Harold. So this sl slide specifically talks a bit about that uh, technology evaluation and, and the tools that are out there. Uh, so HELMS is the Health Enforcement and Licensing Management System. Uh, it is a technology tool and database that has been in development uh, and uh, a project for, for a number of years uh, and is now coming to a go live uh, phase out. Uh, the first version of this is called Helms Light and it specifically replaces the part of the licensing system that interfaces with, uh, with SAW and the application of uh, new healthcare credential licenses coming to us from the public. Uh, the go live date for that was just six days ago on April 24th. It is the first of three uh, phased launches for the Helms system. This being the first, the full credentialing system scheduled for December of this year and the investigation and disciplinary side sometime in 2025. Uh, there's a list of different functions that are uh, it meant to be an improvement over the previous application system. Uh, some of those are uh, be people being able to submit applications from a phone or device, being able to do updates on their profile, including locating and making edits to their applications. Uh, we expect that to significantly reduce paper uh, applications and call volumes for status updates, uh, which frees up more time for uh, higher priority customer service needs and for credential reviews. Uh, there are options to delete or attach applications and require documentation uh, and print payment confirmations and receipt. Uh, and so while all of the efficiencies around this new system uh, will we'll take some time to understand and capture, we're, we're very, very optimistic uh, about this tool uh, being uh, a big help to, to all of us internally and thus uh, externally to all of our customers and interested parties. And you have contact information for all of us, uh, Shauna, Harold, and I, with any questions about this kind of uh, work and improvements, ideas, feedback, uh, we, we love to hear all of it, um, as well as the Helms team for, for specific questions about um, that particular part of, uh, of our improvements. Uh, and thank you for having us today. So happy for the opportunity to share uh, what we've been working on. Thank you so much, Harold and Zach. Um, and if anybody has any questions, comments, suggestions about our internal changes to the process by which we license folks, we are happy to hear those um, offline. But I wanna refocus us back to, to the work at hand today. Um, for a couple of brief slides, we're going to talk about the 2023 recommendations for statute and rule change to reduce barriers. Um, well, if we could have the other slide deck, please, with slide five. I want to thank everyone who participated in our 2023 listening and feedback sessions. Your thoughtful comments and feedback helped us to identify major hurdles and, um, and develop the recommendations I'm about to share that ultimately became law in the 2024 session. Slide six, please. Great. This slide shows the recommendations that the department made for statute changes to reduce barriers. All these recommendations were adopted as part of engrossed second substitute house bill 2247, except for the recommendation to adopt the social work compact, which was included in substitute house bill 1939, effective June 6, 2024. The limitations on the number of renewals for master level counselor associates and substance use disorder professional trainees will be eliminated. Limitations on training locations for substance use disorder trainees will be removed. Time limits for earning supervised experience for substance use disorder trainees will be removed. And an allowance for master's level counselor associates to continue to provide services to established patients while their application is pending becomes effective. Effective October 1st, 2025, a new credential for psychology associates will be available. 
the examining board of psychology has granted the authority to create standards for licensure without exam that reflect the applicant's professional experience. Continuing education requirements for master's level counselors will be moved to rule instead of statute. The requirement for marriage and family therapist associates to have a portion of their supervised experience under a supervisor with five years experience will be reduced to two years to align with other master's level counselor professions. Effective January 21, I'm sorry, January 1st, 2028, Agency affiliated counselors will be eligible to practice in federally qualified health centers. As mentioned briefly, Washington also joined the Interstate Compact for Social Workers. The effective date for this change depends on the actions of other states' legislatures, so we don't know exactly when this will be effective. Currently, six states have adopted the compact, with approximately 20 other states pending legislation. Seven states met to adopt the compact before it can take effect. Next slide, please. The department also made a number of recommendations for rule change in our 2023 recommendations. Section, section six of engrossed substitute House Bill 1724 requires the department to adopt the following changes via emergency rule by July 1st, 2024. Emergency rules are short term, so each project on this in the next slide will begin permanent rulemaking as soon as possible. All of these projects will have public meetings for input from interested parties, and we will share those invitations with you through the email service of GovDelivery. We encourage you to join any GovDelivery lists with professions you are interested in. To join GovDelivery lists, visit our website at doh.wa.gov, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click sign up for updates from DOH. First, we have several rulemaking recommendations for substance use disorder professionals and trainees. The department has drafted emergency rules as required by 1724 that are currently under review. We anticipate emergency rules will be filed and effective early in the summer. The department has also filed a CR 101 to begin permanent rulemaking. Slide eight, please. Here we have the rulemaking recommendations we made last year for master's level counselors and psychology. The master's level counselor program has held workshops and drafted emergency rules, which are currently under review. We anticipate these rules will be filed and effective July 1st, 2024. The department will file a CR 101 to begin the permanent rulemaking process in the next few months. The examining board of psychology has also begun rulemaking on these recommendations. The board is working on drafting emergency rules to implement the recommendations and anticipates finalization of these rules in their May 17th board meeting. We anticipate these rules will be filed by July 1, 2024. Board staff are also simultaneously working on beginning to file a CR 101 to begin the process of permanent rulemaking. They will be holding workshops in the coming months. So if you're interested in learning more or participating in these work groups, we encourage you to join the psychology gov delivery list. We would also like to note that we heard many serious concerns in our 2023 listening sessions about the bias in the social worker or ASWB exam. We did not have time to sufficiently study this issue and make recommendations last year but we've been working hard with a group of interested parties in the interim, and we'll have more information to share about this when we convene again towards the end of the summer to gather your feedback. Slide nine, please. Today, we are seeking your input to determine what rules or laws continue to present barriers and what barriers persist now that we are not able, that we were not able to recommend solutions to last year. Your feedback was essential to us. It will help direct our efforts in making recommendations to the legislature for additional statute and rules changes to reduce licensing barriers for behavioral health professionals. Slide 10. Now we have a few items we'd like you to keep in mind during this listening session. Please be mindful and respectful of all attendees and staff. Please raise your hand if you wish to provide verbal comment and if applicable, state your name or the group of, or association you represent. Due to the number of participants, please limit your comments to two minutes to allow everyone to speak. Also, please stay on the topic of behavioral health licensing barriers. Next slide. We will keep this slide up during the public comment period for all of you to reference the guidelines, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the guiding questions we have provided. Your comments do not have to be specific to one of these questions, but please keep your comments to things the department has the authority to address. For example, we know provider salaries pose a significant barrier for some professions, but the department does not have the authority to affect provider salaries. We also wanna note that we are here today to hear from you. We will respond to technical questions or if anyone needs technical assistance with this Zoom, but generally we will not be responding to questions during the Zoom. 
You may put questions in the chat or Q&A and we will collect them and try to follow up after the meeting, or you can email the program manager for your profession. We've listed the names and contacts for them on the second to last slide. As a final reminder, we are recording this meeting. If you wish to share your comments verbally, please raise your hand using the Zoom hand raise feature and we'll call on you in the order that hands went up. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please type your comments into the chat. We will collect them for review after this meeting. You may also send comments to me via email by Sunday, May 19th. With that, I'd like to invite you to invite your comments. Well, are, is the hand raise feature enabled? Yes. I saw some hands earlier. I don't see any right now. Someone. I believe they're indicating they don't have access. I did see one hand raised for Karen. I apologize, we are working on this. It looks like our hand raise feature is not working just yet. Oh, it looks like some people can raise a hand. So let's go ahead with Jeremy first. Jeremy, are you able to talk? Yeah, I'm able to talk. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I just wanted to see if uh, you all would be willing to comment on the work that's been done with the um, alternatives to the ASWB social work licensure exam work group um, as part of the uh, elimination of the barriers to uh, credentialing that prevent uh, providers from entering or staying in the behavioral health workforce. Thank you, Jeremy. We are not ready to share all of those recommendations just yet. Um, we, that's still a, a work in progress and we plan to share that late in the, um, in the summer when we meet again. So um, suffice it to say for now, we are working um, with a, a group of um, interested parties and we hope to have some really strong recommendations for alternatives to the social work exam um, by the end of the summer. Catherine. Are you able to unmute yourself, Catherine? Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, um, I'm a, a private contractor. I provide clinical supervision um, under my LLC. And I'm um, actually reaching out regarding um, the criteria of the uh, individual supervision for social workers versus the group. And um, I do find this as a barrier um, in providing supervision that um, uh, many times the 60 hours with the one-to-one -one kind of creates some problems for social workers that are, they just have to carry the full burden of that one-to-one. -one. And I find that when they are able to participate in groups um, and they're people from different disciplines or working in substance use or doing mental health or doing hospitalization, they get so much more and they are able to walk away with services and able to serve their clients more. And so I would like to contribute that that 60 hours of one-to-one -one, um, is a bit much, and I'd like to see that reduced and um, more group hours allotted, or at least an, an availability that they can go back and forth on some flexibility to that. Um, I just find it a burden that that individual 60 hours in the social work criteria. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and just for, for clarity, are, is that for um, licensed mental health counselors? Which profession? Um, actually, it's for social work, for the oh, social workers. Uh, the beauty about the licensed mental health counselors is they can do the two to one. And so, you know, the, the individual isn't carrying the full burden all the time. Thank you so much. Britt. <laughs> Britt, are you able to unmute?
Can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you now. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I have a comment about um, substance use professionals or substance use disorder professionals and the HIV class requirement. As I got my education out of state from an accredited university, um, but it didn't. We didn't specifically have an HIV course, and so now that's my greatest barrier to getting my SUDP is that HIV course requirement, having to go back to school to do that, which is not very cost effective or timely. Um, that was the one comment, and then I had another one for the dual credentialing of social work and the SUDP, and the barrier as far as the um, cost for renewals for those licenses, I know that they recently went up in the cost, for, especially for the SUDP. Um, so yeah, that's just been another barrier is how much it costs to have dual licensure. It'd be great if there was, you know, maybe $20 off or something for having two instead of, you know, the one. And that that's all I have. Thank you, Brett. Do we have other other hands? I see Shannon. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm Shannon Thompson. I'm with the Washington Mental Health Counselor Association, and my um, I've been getting a lot of um, people reaching out for moving in from out of state and. One thing that's been a big barrier is having to use the DOH specific forms to track supervision or attest to supervision when they have it all documented on the form that they live of the state that they lived in. So if there's any way to kind of accept those attestations or tracking from out of states on other forms, so they're not, <clears throat> excuse me, they often can't find their supervisors, their supervisors have moved or left the places of employment. So it is a big barrier, especially for those that are moving into Washington. Thank you. Great suggestion. Do we have any other comments? Britt, is that an old hand or a new hand? I see Sivy. Sivy, are you able to, to unmute? I think so. Um, I was curious around with the new supervisor directory, if that is being implemented as part of the new online Helm application as far as verification of the super, the like the supervisory um uh, that they meet the ACS credential. Is that all going to be used together or how are supervisors going to get verified within the new online system? That is a great question. Brandon, are you able to answer that question or do we need to get back to Sylvie? Sylvie? Yeah, I can answer that question. So currently for supervisors, there's uh, for the current process, they don't submit proof to us that they meet the requirements. They are to maintain the documentation and show proof to the associate. Um, if the associate asks for it, it's written on the supervisor form. <clears throat> Excuse me, for the directory, due to the language in the law that was implemented in 1724, that directory has a requirement to be placed on it that you do have to be vetted. So for individuals to go on that voluntary directory right now, they do submit that in their uh, proof of their training, their proof of their experience hours, and that is vetted to be on the form on that directory. Um, as far as how Helms is going to intertwine the two, I can't speak to that, but um, that's something that we can take into consideration. But just for clarity, there's only a, a verification process that the department does for the directory at this time. Thank you, Brandon. Who else has a comment? I see Josette, are you able to unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I, I put a question in the uh, question and answer box that I thought maybe it wasn't being looked at. So um, I'm asking why the certified counselor credential costs $800 to renew annually. 
um, I found out about that information. Uh, one of my staff um, persons, and that is that old credential that still floats around. And she showed me the cost of it, um, which blew my mind uh, because of the rate of pay um, that she received. So I'm wondering if anyone can answer that and will that change or is this just a way to squeeze out that credential? <laughs> so that's a great question, Josette. Um, by statute, all professions have to be self-supporting through fees, which means that the fees have to pay for um, everything associated, all the administrative costs of a profession. And because that profession has gotten very small, um, the administrative costs to each person who are credentialed has gone up significantly. And that's really the reason for that. It's not, there's no intention on the part of the Department of Health to squeeze out the profession. But as folks have um, become credentialed in other professions and that profession has become smaller and smaller, the individual cost to each of the professionals um, has gone up. And that is um, just a function of the fact that each of these, these profession types needs to be self-supporting and the fees have to have to total up to the amount of money that it takes to run the profession. I do, we do recognize that that's an extremely high fee and very difficult for folks who are not making a lot of money to, to sustain. Absolutely. Thank you, Josette. Do we have other comments? I don't know if one of our co-hosts can talk about, um, I can, can let me know if there are comments in the question and answer box that I'm not able to see. Sean, I can read one out if you'd like. Thank you, Brandon, that's helpful. Um, Sibby has asked, Is and, and this may have been addressed already, I can't recall if that's the one I answered or not. Um, is there any movement regarding having the approved clinical supervisor as a license endorsement? And along with, the, with that, are there any other further discussions on what clinical supervision must entail? Well, I would be saying, Brandon, can you answer that one? So I'm gonna say it. <laughs> I, can, I can do my best. To my knowledge, and, I, and I, I might look for some other individuals in the room to help address that. In order to make a supervisor endorsement, I believe that's a legislative action because that would be creating a new standard in the law. I could be mistaken on that, but that's my understanding. So to have an endorsement, any type of new endorsement with the department, that would be a, a law change. As far as uh, details, as far as what clinical supervision must entail, we are currently conducting rules workshops. We've held one and we're gonna be uh, moving forward with some more coming up here shortly. Um, part of 1724 was to outline um, what appropriate supervision looks like. So we're currently having conversations now as far as um, you know, what, what, what supervision looks like, what is an appropriate ratio, um, what must entail supervision, things like that. So that is currently in discussion. Thank you, Brandon. It looks like there's a partner question that says, um, I saw something about there being a stipend to assist with paying for clinical supervision. Is that still on the table? And I can address that one as well. Um, yes, a stipend was introduced in 1724 and re revised in 2247. Um, so there is a stipend that passed in this um, in both legislative sessions. That stipend will not be in effect until Ooh, I can't recall off the top of my head if it's July 2025 or October 2025, um, but there is a stipend that is going to be available that offsets the cost of supervision for associates. It's a voluntary stipend program, and what it does is um, it, it puts a cap on what supervisors may charge who are within that stipend program. So if a supervisor is participating in the stipend, uh, there's a cap on what they can charge associates, and then that supervisor receives a stipend from the department. So it limits what an associate is charged by the supervisor. I want to say off the top of my head, it's $1,600 a year, which from what we've heard from stakeholders is a fraction of what they're paying for supervision already. Um, and then to offset that cost for the supervisors charging less, they would get a stipend from the department. We're still working on that. We got to get the layout of what that's going to look like, but that's the letter of the law as far as how it was passed in 2024. Thank you, Brandon. Are there more comments?
I'm not seeing hands or comments in the chat. I'm going to give us a little up oh, there. We go, Mariah. Go ahead. Sorry, I was trying to get my mic working. We could hear you for a moment, Mariah. And now you've gone quiet again. Try again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry, I'm like trying to put no heads on because the rain is so loud. Is it okay? Anyways, I want are we talking about the barriers currently, like credentialing barriers at this time? I'm trying to follow and it's <laughs> yes, yes, Mariah. We're we're talking about barriers to credit to licensure and any okay. suggestions about how we can improve that those um those barriers through through changes to statute or rule. Okay. Great. So my main thing is, so when, <laughs> long story short, I was five days too late getting my MHP credential sent over because in my previous agency didn't submit my MHP stuff to the state. And so when I got hired at my new job, all of a sudden the LAAC credential was being enacted. Um, I submitted my application. I think it was almost three or four times. The application changed again in October. And then when I finally had everything completed in December, I called Got, um, had approval that everything was in, went to pay, and then um, waited about three months. And all of a sudden, my AAC had um, expired, and I had already paid. And so when I called back in, I found out that um, somebody that that took my money never clicked the next button. So that held me up three, um, it held me up, I think, um, three months. And then um, all of my things didn't bill for like 18 days until... I was um, finally approved through Washington State. And so basically my main thing is, is um, seeing how we can fix when money goes in and if it's going to be actually, you know, click the, somebody didn't click the next button is what happened. So it held everything up. So I had my agency kind of all over me, like what's going on, getting through to um, DSA or DOH was extremely difficult. And so I don't want that to happen to somebody else where I literally was waiting from May until a few weeks ago to get my credential when I should have had my MHP credential back in 2021, but it was just never submitted by my last agency because it was under a agency affiliate. So I'm wondering how we can fix that so that there's no holdups on that. Then, you you know, because like I what I've been under like um, just a regular master's degree for the past year, basically, and lost that credential that I earned. Um, so it, it was very, very challenging for me not knowing what was going on. And we have a lot of people at my current agency trying to get their LAACs, but don't want to go through what I went through. <laughs> so we're just kind of wondering what's the best court way to go about this so it's quick, efficient, and we don't have all the hiccups. Long story short. Thank you, Mariah. I'm so sorry to hear that that happened to you. Um, and we are definitely committed to making some improvements, lots of inter improvements, both internally um, in the way that we work together with, with our customers and with one another, um, as well as, as looking at rule change and, and process change. And um, human error is always a, always a risk anytime there are people involved. But I really want to encourage everyone on this call to encourage anyone that you talk to, um, never to hesitate to reach out to the program manager associated with your profession. If you're not able to reach the program manager, you always can reach out to the executive director. Um, and if you're not able to reach the executive director, you can call Harold or me directly and we'll help connect you to somebody within the profession so that it doesn't feel like such a um, such a hard place to get in touch with a human. So thank you so much for raising that, Mariah. Thank you. Other comments? I know it's it's hard to get some mics going and hands raised, and so I don't want to cut off the opportunity for anyone to speak. I'm just going to be quiet here for the next few minutes and see if we have other comments.
Thank you all for your comments so far. Um, we will wait. It looks like there are comments coming in through the um, through the chat. And I don't know, it looks like that one might just be for Brandon and may not be something that we need to necessarily read out. Catherine, did you want to say anything verbally or are you you okay with just your comment in the in the chat? Yeah, I'm I'm fine with uh, it just going to Brandon and, and um, your your staff there. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Josette. Um, I just wanted to comment. I was in another um, meeting, and one of the um, uh, comments that was, I guess, to be mindful of the attempts to remove barriers is very important, um, and also making sure that um, you know we're in line with other states and how they, you know, what the requirements are for other states, so we're not watering down credentials. Um, and I heard those comments and I was curious, like what with uh, compared to other states and what uh, Washington is doing to remove barriers, um, what, what, what is being done here that's different than what's being done elsewhere or what has been learned from where states are having to address these issues and how is the state of Washington um, uh, making that relevant to how they're you know, addressing this issue? Um, and I will disclose, I sat for my uh, license for clinical social work and uh, it put me in the hospital the day before because I was so stressed out. <laughs> uh, it was, it's, a, it's a hard test. Thank you, Josette. I know there's a lot of work being done in all of the individual professions to look at other states. I can't speak to all of that work. I don't know if any of our program managers um, are able to speak to any of that but we're looking across all the states for best practices. We definitely want to ensure um, patient safety and we want to ensure that professionals um, you know, meet all of the requirements to, to practice safely, but also we don't want any undue barriers. And so with respect to the social work um, exam, we, we are working hard on an alternative pathway that would not involve taking that exam, which we know has, has some problems, especially with respect to equity, diversity and inclusion. There's a question in the chat, um, Eve, I don't know if you saw it, but the question is, is there any thought to removing the requirement for CAAC and LAAC for out of state that verify work experience that the person had to have a credential in their state and specific as to what kind in the FAQ when their position did not require a credential in the, and when their supervisor is or was licensed in their state? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm hoping that you do, Eve. Now, listen, I'm, I'm hoping that if you can, or if you're able to come off mute just for a little bit of clarity, I, I would be very much grateful. Allison, I think I've enabled you to talk if you if you would like to. I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I couldn't before. <laughs> um, so the question is, uh, for example, we have uh, an employee who relocated here from California and was a social worker too. Um, and their position in California did not require any sort of credential. Um, in their new position here, they need the LAAC in order to do their job. However, the hidden in the FAQ and not part of the um, actual requirements says that if you're coming from out of state, your your work had to be supervised and you had to have a credential in the state you were in allowing you to do the work you were doing. However, her work was supervised by someone who is licensed, but because there was no credential required for her position, she doesn't have one and now can't get the LAAC and unfortunately didn't have a practicum with her master's degree, so she can't get an LMHCA either. And so now we're having to find her a new position here that doesn't require either of those. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there's some sort of, I was surprised to hear that because I've been in a lot of the rules and um, things where I did not hear that discussed that they had to have a credential. And then when I inquired with the program manager, they uh, also told me that they're also applying that for in-state 
as well. Um, and I'm assuming that means that they're thinking they had to have the R, the registered agency affiliated um, as part to verify that their work experience was what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just, it's just creating a barrier that it just seems inherently unfair because all the conversations have been about um, you all would be, or the DOH would be verifying um, that their work was supervised by someone who meets the requirements of a mental health professional, not that they also had to have a credential in the state they were coming from. And so I'm just trying to figure out what do we do with someone who their position didn't require one, so they didn't have one. So Allison, I'm going to suggest that you connect with Eve and or Ted Dale um, offline, because this is a pretty specific um, situation, and it sounds like it could use some troubleshooting um, for that the specific applicant. I'm not sure we can answer that here, um, but thank you so much for your question, and I want to encourage you to um, connect with Eve and Ted offline. Right. I'm just concerned it's going to be a problem for other people going forward, not just my person, which is why I mentioned it, but thank you. Okay. I don't know. Ted, do you, do you have any, uh, any brief um, wisdom that you can offer? to that situation or is it better to address this? Um, it's, yeah, it's probably something we can explain better um, through an email or a phone call for that. But typically for our experience um, requirements, you need to have a credential in order to provide counseling. If it's if it's open to, a, or if it's counseling provided at a level that doesn't require a credential to do it, then it's probably not credential, then it's not work that would elevate to the level to qualify for our experience. So um, typically that's why we require everything to be done under a certification um, or, you know, some kind of a license to do that kind of work so that we know that it's done at an equivalent level. So like for the social worker, you could just be connecting somebody with resources as opposed to, um, you know, actually providing counseling for something like that. And so you wouldn't need a credential to do that work, but that's not the level of work that we want to qualify. We want them to actually be at a counseling level and providing, you know, mental health counseling for that kind of stuff. But I, I dropped my uh, email in the, the chat box. So if you wanted to just shoot me an email, we can set up a time to talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. And it looks like in the chat, Mariah had a, a related um, a related comment. And so I know this is not an uncommon challenge um, for folks. Um, there was a hand, a couple of hands. Let me see if I can find them. I am not an expert at this um, Zoom business. So I'm looking for where these hands are because I saw them before and now, oh, there they are. Okay, Daniel, are you able to, um, to speak? Yeah, I'm here. I just joined the meeting. Uh, just a minute, a couple minutes ago. So I'm not sure if we're in the portion where it's where you're taking comments or if there's a line that I need to get in. But nope, it's your yeah, turn. Go ahead. My turn. Okay. And uh, I, I can't seem to figure out how to turn my video on. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So um, I just to give you a little background. First of all, thank you to the DOH and to you uh, for hosting this. Uh, I really appreciate the <clears throat> attention that the Department of Health is um, devoting to this question of barriers for mental health professionals. And I would like to um, provide some feedback for the DOH about the experience of uh, trying to obtain licensure in Washington State as a psychologist. Um, I am a licensed psychologist in Arizona, and I've been working on transferring my license here to Washington State for the past several years. Um, there's a few things I'd like to say. Uh, basically, I have kind of four main bullet points. I'll try to go through them as quickly as possible and just let me know if, you know, I need to stop if there's like a time limit, I, I, I won't be too long, but just let me know if, if, I, if I run out of time here. Thank um, you, Daniel. We are, we are asking folks to stay around two minutes. Go ahead. Okay, okay. So um, the first uh, issue in terms of licensing psychologists is, uh, you know, I've, I've been in this process of seeking licensure in Washington for, for like I said, a few years now. And uh, I'm well aware of the national standards for granting licensure state by state to, to psychologists. And um, basically we're looking at a situation here where Washington state has become 
extraordinarily restrictive and rather arduous um, in, their, in their licensing process for psychologists specifically. Um, the recent decision the board made just a year and a half ago to eliminate reciprocity from Arizona is problematic. I mean, prior to this, when I was in school, my colleagues from Arizona were, were moving okay. It was okay to move to Washington and they'd get licensed and now they're in practice. But the board has recently deemed Arizona to be um, not substantially equivalent. And this is just a recent decision they made. And I, I do find that to be problematic. And I, I, I recommend returning Arizona to um, a, an equivalency standard. The other barrier is the Board of Health, does, uh, excuse me, the Board of Psychology seems to be struggling with over restrict restrictions on curriculum domains for psychologists in their education. Um, the, the APA recommends eight curriculum domains and the national average is around 11. Washington has 15 curriculum domains. And so this is presenting a restriction for many psychologists. And it's a problem partially because the process of validating classes we take in our doctorate program, if we don't graduate from an APA school is extraordinarily burdensome, you know, requiring many, many, many hours of, of work. And it's, it drags on for a long time. Now, the last thing I say, I, I'm aware of the time. The last thing I'll say is, um, communicating with the Department of Health and the Board of Psychology about my license and my application is extraordinarily slow. I submitted my application on March uh, 28th, uh, excuse me, November 28th of 2023. And I have only received three correspondences from the DOH since then. And, and in between these correspondences is a month. So the first issue was they misread my internship hours and they rejected my application based on a misread of my internship hours. So I corrected their oversight and I resubmitted the documents with more legible writing so they could see it and still no resolution. I mean, this is a, with a phone call, this could have been resolved in five minutes and it's been about two months. So I'm, I'm bringing this to your attention just to highlight the delay in correspondence is extraordinary and, and, and very arduous. So that's, that's all. I'll, I'll wrap it up. Thank you. I really appreciate Thank you. It. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. And I want to, I want to encourage you to reach out to Joe Miller, who's the executive director of our psychology, um, Kaylin, um, Robinson Goodman and Nancy Delgado, who both um, provide program support for that um, for that program. And you know, as I as I said earlier, if you anyone has trouble getting in touch with our, our staff, or or you, um, I would definitely recommend reaching out to the program manager. So thank you for that comment. And, and how I think we find the program managers information. They are all in the chat for you just now. We we put all of those those email addresses in the chat for you as we were as we were talking. Thank you so much. And Brandon, I think Brandon had a, a response for Mariah's comment in the chat. Go ahead, Brandon. Yep, there we are, sorry. Yes, I wanted to just address Mariah's comment in the chat um, and I'll summarize it real quick for those who can't see it. Essentially, it's in regards to uh, the specific course content requirements for the master's level counselor credentials and the barriers of those can pose for some. I, and the desire for some professional experience to substitute I do want to just point out that the requirements, the individual course content is in law. So that's something we can at least acknowledge today and take back for consideration, but it would require a statutory change to address the course content. But the Department of Health is currently conducting a rulemaking stemming from some of our 1724 listening sessions and the emergency rules that were brought up at the beginning of this meeting to allow for professional experience to be utilized in the substitution, uh, as a substitution for the clinical practicum component for the LMHC credential. Um, it's at this time not being considered for the LMFT and the social work program um, due to specifics in their laws and rules. But for at least the LMHC credential, we are, um, we actually just approved language last week to move forward in emergency rules that will allow for an individual with an AAC in good standing, all three of them, 
um, with at least 600 hours of clinical experience in a counseling in the counseling related practice of AAC uh, to be utilized in lieu of that practicum. So for individuals who are you know, they have the course content, but they don't have the practicum. We are exploring opportunities to allow for that experience to qualify. That will be in effect as of July 1st, 2024 by per, uh, emergency rules and then standard rules by July 1st, 2025. That might not address the total issue you're expressing as far as the course content, but we are limited by the law on that. Um, but we are making adjustments to reduce that barrier for the practicum component. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Joe said, is that an old hand or a new hand? Thank you. Brooke, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to, I know you, it was just kind of answered, um, but I, I wanted to put another plug out for the course content. Um, I am someone who spent 13 years as an MHP. I supervise uh, crisis team wise, but could never um, become licensed because of course content. I have a degree in psychology. Um, and I, I actually ran across many, many people um, in this situation where they had gotten a degree, um, decided to pursue some sort of counseling, would like to be licensed, um, but were, was able to, you know, be pretty successful um, without a license in certain domains, um, I think we're leaving out a whole population of people out of licensure. Um, and it's, you know, obviously we, I would have to go back to school. I stuck it out and, and had my loans forgiven um, due to being in public service for 10 years. And, you know, the last thing I want to do is go back to school, um, take more classes and get into more debt to become licensed. Um, and I would love to do that. I would love to hold a license. Um, and so I just want to put it out there. I think there's a whole subsection of people that have master's degrees that just can't get licensed. Thank you, Brooke. I'm in that boat as well. Oh, I'm sorry. It's so frustrating. <laughs> I do. I do understand that frustration for sure. Do we have other comments? I'm just going to hold this space for a few minutes and see if folks have any comments. Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, yeah, just speaking up again, I, I, I understand I just went, but I wanted to just weigh in on one more thing. Uh, I, I had attended the listening sessions that were hosted uh, last year and you know, again, was encouraged by the attention to the to the issues here, but I I, I seem to um, notice some stimulation or movement from the board of psychology after those meetings, but it 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 didn't persist. I mean, there was there was a noticeable responsiveness and attention and those first few weeks and months. And then it seems to have fallen off the radar or something. This is just a, you know, an outsider perspective, but I do attend the board meetings and I observe and watch and, you know, pay attention to what's going on. And some of the intent with this um, law, law change, the, uh, what is it? Two, two SHB, um, something along that line. Um, that, that It's such a, important intent and such an important initiative, but it, it's, it's just my observation that it's not quite translating into action yet or, or something like that. I, I just wanted to make that comment that the intent is, is really spot on, but, but wondering about how it's getting onto the radar of the people on the board of psychology to really look in detail at, at what concrete steps might be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Daniel. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the Board of Psychology has been looking at a number of different 
improvements and they have adopted a number of um, new substantially equivalent states um, since this has passed. Are there other comments? I'm going to hold this space for another five minutes, and if we don't have comments after five minutes, we will um, move to adjourn. Five minutes of silence is a lot of minutes. I'm thinking maybe I should have gone for three. I wanna thank you all for your comments so far. Um, and thank you so much for your participation. This information is all gonna be really helpful as we begin to draft our recommendations for improving the behavioral health care licensing process. We have three more listening sessions, um, two in the evening and one more daytime session. You're all welcome to attend those additional sessions. Um, our team is gonna spend the next few months after these sessions conclude, reviewing our comments, researching, drafting preliminary recommendations, and we'll be planning to reach back out to all of you in late summer to get your feedback on our preliminary recommendations based on these um, feedback sessions before we present them to the legislature on or around November 1st, 2024. We've created a website for this work and we'll be posting the recordings of these listening sessions there in English and in Spanish, as well as a video of the ASL interpretation. We'll also send out an email via Gov Delivery with, this, with a link um, to that page shortly after the listening session. Before we go, I wanna thank our wonderful interpreters for all their hard work. We appreciate your time and your help in making our work more accessible to Washingtonians. And with that, we'll close this meeting. Thank you so much for your thoughtful comments and for the time you've spent with us today. Please reach out to the appropriate program manager listed on this slide if you have any other questions. Will, if you could advance the slide, I would really appreciate it. Oh, one more. One more slide, please. Thank you. Here's our, here are our program managers, program contacts. Thank you all for your time today.